I have the pleasure of introducing Marcus Studley. Uh, he is a neurosurgeon who made it all the way from Australia to give this, uh, this talk, which we are excited about. Having neurosurgeons speak to us and, and interact with us is critical because they're the ones that are actually doing the, the treatment of Chiari patients and they provide us with that feedback. And Marcus is, is a pretty impressive neurosurgeon because uh, I, I've gotten to know a lot of neurosurgeons over the last few years working in, in, in Chiari and it amazes me how they find time to do research. But their clinical duties, so us as engineering professors, we have to teach and do research and maybe some administration. And then typically many of us are moaning and groaning that the teaching is too much. But Marcus is doing clinical work on Chiari syringomyelia as well as vascular disorders as well. And in his spare time, he's managed to create the, one of the largest research labs in Australia for neurosurgical research. Published around, I think, 100 journal papers. Monitors students, I think he has 15 students he supervised. All the, all the while by being head of the Department of Neurosurgery as well. So he's doing the administrative side the clinical side and the research side. So with that, I will uh, lay the floor to Marcus and tell all of us we need to work harder so we can be like Marcus. <laughs> so thanks, um, Frank and John and Keith and Dorothy for in inviting me here to speak today. It's, real, it's a real privilege to be here and uh, hopefully it's, it's helpful for you. I, I really enjoyed Dorothy's uh, introduction. It really is a touching reminder of what, of what this is all about. Um, so it was a great start. So uh, neurosurgeons have to put up these kind of slides. I, I can be bought, so if you, if you want to uh, <laughs> donate money and stuff, then, that, then that's fine. I've had relationships with a couple of companies, but they're not significant. So just in case people don't know, Syringa myelia comes fr from the Greek uh, mythology, where this is, this is Syrinx, who's a Greek. Um, woman, and she's being chased by the, the god Pan, and she didn't want to borrow him, so when he was about to catch her, she prayed to the other gods and got transformed into a bunch of reeds, and as he tried to grab her, she had turned into reeds, and he was disappointed and sighed, and as he sighed, his breath went out across these reeds and made a, a musical sound, and that's the origin of the Pan pipes, but now any tubular structure is named after Syrinx, this woman, so a syringe and syringa myelia is, is a tube, and the myelos, of course, comes from the marrow. But syringa myelia is a very uh, heterogeneous condition. It's associated with other, other things. It doesn't usually happen just, be, just on its own. It happens secondary to something else. And you can divide it up into these kind of conditions. There's craniocervical conditions and spinal conditions, congenital and acquired. But basically, we can narrow it down to those, these main conditions. So there's the Craniocervical junction abnormalities, and in particular Chiari malformation, spinal cord injury, very common cause of syringomyelia, and then scarring in the subarachnoid space, uh, spina bifida and other dysraphic disorders, and spinal tumours. That covers probably over 90% of syrinx cases. If you look at medical textbooks, they'll describe syringomyelia in terms that imply that it's a rather passive kind of process. If you look at a normal spinal cord, that's the central canal, that little tiny bit there. This is the grey matter and white matter. And this is what you see pathologically with syringomyelia. There's this big cavity. But you would get the impression from that that it's a, a, a destruction of tissue, a loss of tissue, and, a, and in a sense a passive... Uh, but the cyst is a passive response to loss of tissue. Whereas, in fact, we know that's not the case. Syrinx cavities are, are often very dramatic. So this is one where... That's the normal spinal cord. This is the syrinx cavity going right up into the brain stem. So that's capable of killing this person. And that's a cross section. So the normal spinal cord is that tissue stretched all around it. This is not a passive uh, loss of tissue. This is a, a highly dynamic uh, condition. And with our dynamic MR imaging, we, we can get an appreciation of just what happens during the cardiac cycle. So here, this is this patient with the brain stem syrinx. And every pulsation, the brain stem is is banging like this. So if you, if you cast your mind back to that pathological picture, it's nothing like this. And yet that's what a lot of doctors, and particularly neurologists I find, imagine when they think of syringomyelia. They think of this passive process. And at operation, we get an even better appreciation of it. This is a person with a post-traumatic syrinx. 
for the neurosurgeons in the room, it's below the level of injury, so I'm not being too careful about where the cup goes. But I'm opening into the spinal cord, and this fluid is coming out of the syrinx cavity. And so that's giving a hope and appreciation of, of just how much pressure is in these cavities, or can be in these cavities, and how dynamic it is. Syrinx cavities come in different, different flavours, if you like. I showed you the central canal as the central part of the spinal cord earlier, and in, the, in one type, it's an expansion of the central canal, either communicating with the fourth ventricle, and this happens particularly in spina bifida, or separate from the fourth ventricle. So there is a central canal that's not particularly, that's not open, so there's no fluid communication between those and the syrinx cavity. Or, and, and this particularly happens with Chiari malformation, or it can be that the cavity starts com completely separate from the central canal. And that happens particularly in spinal cord injury and arachnoiditis. So there may be different types of uh, pathophysiology underlying this. So that's an example, Chiari malformation with uh, syrinx in the central canal, expansion of the central canal. So in this patient, that spinal cord is actually functioning completely normally. All the normal spinal cord tissue is stretched around that syrinx cavity and they have no neurological deficits as a result of that. In our animal models we do it this way, so there's uh, occlusion of the central canal in certain places and an expansion of the central canal on either side of that and that's just the same as what happens in human cavities. But patients can become symptomatic from these syrinx cavities if the syrinx ruptures through the central canal. So in this patient, that's the expanded central canal but it's ruptured through the appendable lining and here it's damaged the cord. So that person will have a neurological deficit related to that particular cord damage. This is a patient where the syrinx has started outside the central canal, so they have uh, neurological damage related to that. So this is outside the central canal from the beginning. And that happens particularly with arachnoiditis, so that's actually bone as uh, the final stage of very severe arachnoiditis. If we go back to the medical textbooks again, uh, syringomyelia is, is often called an example of central cord syndrome, which implies that there is damage or loss of that central part of the spinal cord tissue. And that, hap that affects, theoretically, the crossing spinothalamic fibres. These are the fibres that carry the pain and temperature sensation of the body, and they cross to the other side. So if you, if you had a tumour or infarct or something that actually damaged that tissue, what you get is loss of pain and temperature at the level where those fibres are crossing, not above it and not below it. So you get this suspended or cape-like distribution of sensory loss. That's the way that uh, medical textbooks call it. But as I've explained, it's not like that here in syringomyelia. It's not actually destruction of tissue. The tissue is stretched around the syrinx cavity. And so the reason that we get the, the pain and temperature loss is not destruction of that central cord tissue, it's this dissection of the, the uh, central canal expansion into the dorsal horns. And that's been shown quite clearly that if you get a simple syrinx like this with expansion of the central canal, no dissection, you don't tend to, tend to get sensory deficits and pain, but if you get dissection, it happens particularly into the dorsal horns, you do get the spinothalamic fibres, but it's not the way that medical, medical textbooks would have you believe. So how does, how does syringomyelia happen? As I said, it's, it's secondary to something else. So what is it about these other things that cause a syrinx to, to form? Well, again, if you go to the medical textbooks, there are a few uh, old theories, but basically they can be divided into those that imply that there is some change in CSF dynamics or uh, that the fluid comes from other sources. This is the theory of Gardner, which uh, basically says that the pulsations in Chiari malformation, because the Chiari malformation blocks the fluid flow into the spine, the fluid flows from the fourth ventricle down the central canal and expands it, and it can't get back. Whereas Williams, a uh, British neurosurgeon, had a completely opposite viewpoint, which was that the Chiari malformation uh, acted as a kind of a valve or one-way plug that when you coughed or sneezed, fluid would go from the spine up into the head and then the Chiari malformation would block CSF going back into the spine. And so the only way it could get back in was into the fourth ventricle and down the central canal into the, in to form a syrinx <coughs> cavity. But the problem with those theories is that for most Chiari malformation patients, the syrinx is quite remote from the fourth ventricle. There's the fourth ventricle. 
here's the syrinx. And so you'd have to argue that fluid is coming down this microscopic central canal through here, that microscopic channel, to form this syrinx. And uh, I think we can assume that that's not really uh, feasible. There are theories that suggest that the fluid comes through the cord itself, um, either from uh, Ball and Dayan, which uh, who said that if you cough and sneeze, it increases the subarachnoid space pressure, that forces fluid through the cord, or more recently, Oldfield, who says that the tonsillar pulsations increase the spinal subarachnoid pressure and force fluid across the cord uh, tissue into the central canal to make it expand. But the problem with those theories is that you can't have a cavity on the inside of the cord that gets bigger when you have pressure on the outside of it. It's just physically impossible. There would have to be some sort of complex valvular mechanism to make that happen. And another piece of evidence against that as a theory, I think, is the fact that when you put a shunt into a syrinx, into the subarachnoid space, the syrinx collapses. So here's a patient where it's an idiopathic syrinx, there's a large syrinx in the cervical cord. I've operated and put a short tube from the syrinx into the spinal subarachnoid space and the syrinx collapses. But if those theories of pressure from the outside were true, that should make the syrinx get bigger if you put a, an, an open conduit from the outside to the inside. And so I think that's a piece of evidence against that. A further piece of evidence against that is that the tonsillar motion with cardiac pulsations is really quite small. So this is a, not a Chiari patient, but we're seeing here the amount of tonsillar movement. And this is another patient where they've got arachnoiditis here. So there's scarring here and very little tonsillar movement, and yet there's a very large syrinx. So I, I, I'm not convinced, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, that tonsillar pulsation alone can be the explanation of fluid flow into the cord. It could be that there is outflow obstruction. So as you'll see, uh, as I go through the talk, there is evidence that fluid is flowing into the cord quite rapidly, and particularly in syrinx patients. And so it must, because for most patients the syrinx is relatively stable, there must be an equal outflow. So it could be that there is a, a problem with uh, outflow obstruction that leads to buildup of fluid in the cord. And so one potential argument is that Chiari malformation causes compression of the tissue here, uh, venous obstruction, obstruction of fluid outflow through that part of the cord. Or it could be a uh, uh, venturi effect, so that um, as you, if you increase the velocity of CSF flow uh, because of the Chiari malformation, that you get expansion of the, of this, of the syrinx in, in that way. Again, you'd have to be arguing that the CSF velocity here is affected by that uh, here in such a way as to expand the central canal, and I, I'm not convinced by that either. It gets more complicated so that uh, in post-traumatic cases, there's an argument that the pulse that's been transmitted down the subarachnoid space, where there's obstruction related to scarring from injury, that that pulse gets get transmitted through the cord and expands fluid below the obstruction. I'm not sure I completely understand all these, all these arrows and things. Perhaps you can, you can help me understand. But again, I'm not convinced. And the velocity of, of CSF flow in the, in, the, in the spine is actually very low. It's in the order of a couple of centimetres per second. So you know, I don't think the velocities here are large enough to account for these physical changes. There's an argument that perhaps there's an abnormality of the spinal, the blood spinal cord barrier. So the blood is leaking out through the vessels uh, to <laughs> increase the fluid load in the cord, and there's some evidence for that. So this is a contrast MRI, and so there's contrast here in the cord around a syrinx. But I think an alternative point of view is that the blood spinal cord barrier disruption is secondary to the syrinx formation, and perhaps it becomes a positive feedback me mechanism so that more fluid can get into it. But I don't think it, there's a reason to believe that the Chiari malformation primarily causes blood spinal cord barrier disruption in the cord below it. So, if you look at all of those theories that relate to these conditions that cause syringomyelia, you could say but for all of those conditions there is an abnormality in the, in the spinal subarachnoid space or at the craniosubarchal junction. And perhaps it's an abnormality of subarachnoid space that's causing the problem. Well, no, because in cases like this where it's a, this patient has had a lipomyelomeningocele, there is absolutely no abnormality in the subarachnoid space, at least that we know about and yet she's got this extensive syrinx going right up into the top of the spinal cord. When you look at the sub subarachnoid space there, it's completely normal. And then there are many cases where we can't actually identify 
the presumed underlying cause. So what we would call idiopathic. So in this example, significant syrinx, no Chiari malformation, no spinal cord injury, no tumour, no evidence of arachnoiditis. And so uh, it's difficult to work out what would be going on with those. So as much as we've, everyone in this room has looked at all these kind of things, I'd argue that we still don't really understand what the pathogenesis is here. There's no theory that explains all the different types of syrinx. Perhaps there are different, method, different mechanisms for different types. Um, and there's no theory that explains how a syrinx can enlarge, and it can only enlarge if the pressure inside it is greater, at least for a period of time, than the surrounding tissue and the surrounding subarachnoid space. So there's something that is getting fluid into the cord that's allowing it or forcing it to expand out against the pressure of the subarachnoid space. We've thought of it in this way, that there must be, there may be conditions that initiate a syrinx, there'll be inflow factors, outflow factors, tissue, fac tissue uh, characteristics, and the composition of fluid that may be involved. And we've looked at most of those things. So I'll go through some of the work that we've done to address all of those, all of those factors. There's been work, e even from the 1980s, showing that there is fluid flow from the subarachnoid space into the brain and spinal cord through the perivascular spaces, the Verkaraban uh, spaces. And the idea here is that the CSF in the subarachnoid space, which is not just a completely open space, it's, right, it's structurally quite complex, but the fluid is coming in around blood vessels, entering the tissue of the spinal cord, and that that, that fluid somehow might be responsible for forming syrinx cavities outside the central canal or inside the central canal. So we started with some work using CSF traces, and in this case it's horse radius peroxidase, and showed that in, in normal animals it's a very rapid circulation. So if you inject a tracer in the cisterna magna in rats, this is five minutes later at the conus, so right down the other end of the spinal cord, the tracer has reached perivascular spaces in central grey matter, and that there is evidence that it is moving directly into the central canal. So there is this rapid flow of fluid from subarachnoid space into the central canal through the cord tissue. And we showed evidence, as did Reynolds, that this flow doesn't happen if you don't have arterial pulsations. What we did with this experiment was, in sheep, we were able to ligate the, uh, the aorta so that we could keep the blood pressure steady, but just dampen the pulsations. And so whereas in a normal animal, there is trace that it gets from perivascular spaces into central canal, if you keep the blood pressure steady but reduce the amplitude of pulsations, it doesn't get into the cord. So there's strong evidence that it is arterial pulsation dependent. We also showed that if you lowered the subarachnoid space pressure by putting a shunt and draining some of the fluid out, it also didn't get in. So we, in that situation where we put a shunt from the subarachnoid space into the peritoneal cavity and thereby lowering the subarachnoid space pressure, there was some flow into perivascular spaces but it didn't get into the central canal. So it's pressure related and pulsation related. Um, my friend Hal Rakate uh, kindly produced this, uh, this schematic showing what we're thinking about here, which is that the pulsations in the subarachnoid space are somehow forcing fluid through the cord tissue into the central canal. So we took that further by looking at some animal models. And if you bear in mind those different types of syringomyelia, there's canalicular syringomyelia and extra canalicular syringomyelia. So for the canalicular model, what we do is inject kaolin into the cord, and that causes these obstructions of the, these ependymal adhesions, <coughs> causing obstructions of the central canal, and between those adhesions, you get enlargement of the central canal with a syrinx that looks histologically just like a human syrinx. For the extra canalicular model, we've had two versions of the model. The first was we mimicked spinal cord injury by focusing on the excitotoxic amino acid component of the injury as, as what we were assuming was the initiating factor of a small syrinx cavity. And then adding on to that arachnoiditis, the scarring in the subarachnoid space that occurs with spinal cord injury that is very important for syrinx development clinically. And so we got very nice uh, extra canalicular syrinx cavities here. There's the central canal, extra canalicular syrinx. We've been criticised a bit 
in the li literature, or at least when we submit papers, that this is not really a spinal cord injury. So to counter that, we we actually do now use an injury model. So we have computer-controlled impactor plus the arachnoiditis, and we get similar extracanalicular syrinx cavities. And in those models, we studied that fluid flow through perivascular spaces and showed that even in the presence of an enlarged central canal, we're still getting this perivascular flow that gets into the central gray matter vessels and preferentially flowing into the central canal, even as it's, as it's figured. A little bit more difficult to show here, but this is the syrinx cavity in the extracanalicular model, perivascular space, and fluid flow or tracer flow from perivascular spaces into extracanalicular syrinx cavities. In doing this, we noticed that when you've got arachnoiditis, we, uh, we noticed that the flow into the cord near the level of arachnoiditis was greater than at other levels. So in this experiment, the tracer is injected into the cisterna magna. And if you look at the fluid flow into the cord at C5, it gets into the ventral median fissure and the vessels here, but it's not reaching the central canal at the time point that we studied. But further away from the point of injection, at the level of arachnoiditis, there is ex extensive CSF flow into the cord. And that fits with our clinical observations as well, that when you have arachnoiditis, you get edema and syrinx is at the level of arachnoiditis, which made us consider that there was an increase in fluid flow uh, somehow caused by the arachnoiditis. And so we studied that in a not in a syrinx model, but just an arachnoiditis model, and again showed that there was this preferential flow close to the level of arachnoiditis more than uh, away from the level of arachnoiditis. We've moved to different uh, CSF tracer uh, techniques and still show that not only with arachnoiditis, but with con extradural constriction. So if you, are, if you put a ligature around the dura and just constrict the subarachnoid space, you also get an increase in fluid flow into the central gray matter at the level of constriction. And uh, Lynn Bilston and her team have done some very uh, clever work looking at uh, the modeling effects of what arachnoiditis or obstruction of the subarachnoid space does to the fluid flow and shown that, um, you're gonna talk about this later, aren't you? Not no, that no, that's one, okay. So it's shown that there is an increase in pulse pressure uh, as a result of the arachnoiditis. And that's become more sophisticated with this 3D modelling and looking at the differences between the fluid flow do uh, dorsal and ventral to the cord as a result of arachnoiditis. And it seems that arachnoiditis dorsal to the cord has a much greater effect on the subarachnoid space pressure than arachnoiditis ventral to the cord. And that fits with our clinical observations as well. And that made us think, if, if it's not, it might not just be the actual pulse pressure, because as I said, it can't just be the pressure on the outside that's driving fluid to the cord to make a syrinx expand. Is it a timing problem? So for example, whether it's Chiari malformation or arachnoiditis, is that somehow changing the way that the CSF pulse travels down the spine and making it out of sync with the blood, uh, the arterial pulse that arrives to the cord unimpeded by the Chiari malformation or arachnoiditis. And so uh, we did some uh, computational modelling showing that based on the idea that if the, when the arterial pulse reaches the cord, presumably the arteries expand and the, and the perivascular space may change in its dimensions. Now this is coming to the point of thinking that the perivascular space structure may in some way act as a one-way valve, or at least a partial one-way valve, which is the only way that you could get this uh, fluid flow into the cord, expanding the, the cavity from within. So if the, if the CSF pulse arrives at the time at, during diastole, there is more opportunity for fluid to flow into the prevascular spaces than if the CSF pulse arrives during systole. And this is the modelling effect of that, so that as you increase the, the phase difference, you increase the fluid flow into the, into the cord. And remember, that's across m presumably millions of perivascular spaces through the cord. And so we looked at that in Chiari patients, thinking, does Chiari somehow change that pulse transmission, and is that responsible for syrinx uh, formation? 
And we found that yes, it does. So that in control patients, this is the CSF pulse, and there is a delay of the pulse transmission into the spine in Chiari patients. We looked then at um, Chiari patients with and without syringa myelia, and actually found that the syringa myelia patients were more like the controls than the patients with Chiari but not syringa. So that's still puzzling. If you think about the perivascular flow story, that I think we can safely say that perivascular flow into the cord is a normal physiological process and that it continues during the enlargement of our animal models of syringa myelia. There is a reason to think that blockages of subarachnoid space flow and changes in pressure uh, may increase the perivas perivascular flow and that that has potential role, or it may explain the increase in fluid flow in some conditions associated with uh, syringa myelia. We've done a bit of work looking at outflow. So it's got to be, a, it's not just inflow, it's outflow as well. We started actually wanting to know where does fluid go to from a syrinx? And it's a bit hard to do that in, in rat models, so in Australia we have lots of these animals and so uh, we can use them. The advantage of using a sheep is that we can actually do ultrasounds on the, on the cord. Here's a normal cord, that's the dura, that's the surface of the cord. And we can actually see the central canal in a normal spinal cord. And here's our syrinx model in a sheep. And so we can actually get a needle and put it under ultrasound guidance into the syrinx cavity and inject a tracer. And when we do that, there's the syrinx cavity and here's the tracer mostly apparently diffusing away from the syrinx cavity, but there is some evidence suggesting that there is a preferential flow towards the central grey matter and into the central canal. So there's more tracer here than there is in the uh, external white matter, for example. But to be honest, we, we realised after that experiment that we really don't know where the normal fluid outflow is from the cord. So we know that fluid's coming into the cord all the time, but we don't really know where it's going. So we kind of took a backward step away from the syrinx model and we're now looking at, um, at what happens if you inject a tracer actually into the cord. And this is work that we're currently doing, so I can't really show you much in the way of results, but we're looking at grey matter and white matter separately because it may be that the fluid outflow pathways are different in, in each uh, part of the cord. And we're looking particularly at the types of vessels uh, associated with perivascular flow that, um, that the fluid is going out around. And I'll come to explain why in a minute. We've done a little bit of work looking at the tissue properties and in particular the gliosis that forms around syrinx cavities. And there's some evidence that the gliosis uh, in post-traumatic syrinxes may act as a constricting force to contain the, the size of the syrinx. So we showed, for example, that over time uh, in the post-traumatic syrinx model there's a gradual increase in size of the syrinx cavity and then a decrease that corresponded with the maturation of the gliotic scar around the syrinx cavity. So, so it's, it makes sense, I guess, that the stronger the scar around the syrinx cavity, the more it's going to be able to contain the, 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 um, the cavity. I mentioned before the blood spinal cord barrier is a potential avenue for fluid flow into the cord. We've looked at, th these are normal animals, so the, the red is um, the showing an uh, endothelial barrier antigen, so that's showing all the blood vessels. Um, and then this is the, um, all the blood vessels with, with uh, tight junctions. And this is the endothelial uh, marker showing all the blood vessels. And so that it should match up. So in controls, uh, it matches up. In canalicular syringa myelia, <coughs> there's not a lot of change. So in, around the central canal, the in our model at least, there's not much disruption of the blood spinal cord barrier. And when we inject a tracer systemically, it doesn't really leak out. There's a, perhaps a tiny bit of leakage in some of these vessels, but there's no evidence of large fluid flow uh, into the cord from, the, from those blood vessels. But the extra canalicular model is quite different. So here, uh, maybe a little hard to see with the lights, but that's a syrinx cavity. On the other side of the cord, the blood spinal, blood spinal cord barrier is completely intact. But on the side where the syrinx cavity is, the blood spinal cord barrier is disrupted on the whole side of the cord, not just around where the syrinx cavity is. And when we inject a tracer into the systemic blood circulation, 
it leaks out into the cord tissue uh, adjacent to the syrinx cavity. So there's some evidence that, at least in the extracanalicular type, that it results in uh, the injury or the syrinx enlargement results in disruption of the blood spinal cord barrier, and that can contribute to the fluid load in the cord. So it may be a, a vicious uh, circle or positive feedback. Aquaporins are presumably important because these are the fluid channels that um, allow water to go through cells in tissues. Um, we've, this, these are normal animals showing that aquaporin co-localizes with astrocytes. As expected, astrocytes are marked with GFAP. In the extra canalicular model, uh, we showed that there is a... It's a bit hard to see, I think, with the lights, but... Um, The canalicular model, uh, there's not much change in the aquaporins, but in the extra canalicular model, there is. So I'll just go through to that. There is a, an, an increase in aquaporin expression around extra canalicular syrinx cavities. But that doesn't necessarily say that they're good or bad. And so we did, we've worked with um, Andrea Yule, who works in Adelaide, who's developed some pharma pharmacological methods to manipulate aquaporin 4 function and th th that's fine so if we look at syrinx cavity size with no manipulation we get that as our average size if we increase aquaporin function so in other words increase the fluid flow through aquaporin channels we find smaller syrinx cavities and if we block aquaporin function we get larger syrinx cavities so it seems as though and this is I guess preliminary results but that would suggest that aquaporin-4 is a, a good thing to have around syrinx cavities and that it helps or facilitates fluid outflow from the syrinx cavities. And that's something we're, going to, we're working on further to see if we can uh, change syrinx cavity sizes with uh, aquaporin manipulation. As you may know, aquaporin is not the only uh, channel that's important in fluid transfer across cells. Aquaporins are associated with uh, potassium. Uh, this is the potassium uh, inwardly rectifying channel. And we've shown that there is a change in the uh, inwardly rectifying channel of potassium with particularly the extra canalicular syrinx model where there's a uh, reduction in the, at the level of, uh, of injury in the expression of the um, uh, potassium uh, channel. And the idea there is that that's meaning that the fluid is unable to be cleared as well as it might be because there's a change in that, in that uh, channel expression. So there's, there's work there still needs to be done, but I think there's evidence that there can be a contribution from the surrounding parenchyma, the expression of water channels that are involved, and that perhaps targets for therapy in the future. We've also looked at tonsil emotion. So remember earlier I said that there's a theory that the pulsation of the tonsils into the spinal subarachnoid space increases the pressure and causes fluid to flow into the cord. This is uh, the theory from uh, Heiss and Ed Oldfield. Uh, we think that the tonsil emotion is actually relatively small and unlikely to be a major factor, but we've investigated that. With uh, uh, using these dynamic scans, uh, where we can follow the tonsil emotion, but also looking at other landmarks as well. So what we've done is, on those dynamic MR scans, tagged all these points using uh, automated techniques. So we can tag, for example, that's the tip of the tonsil, and then we can follow it during the cardiac cycle and, and get measurements of, of that motion. And what we found was that... Uh, well, here, and, and also looked at preoperative and postoperative cases. So this is the same patient. Preoperatively, there is a reasonable amount of motion there, and there's less motion in the postoperative uh, de after decompression. If you focus on the superior inferior direction, there is a decrease in tonsil motion with surgery, as expected. Um, these are all the different anatomical points, and they all reduce uh, their motion after uh, postuphosal decompression. But most importantly, we're looking at the chiari malformation without syrinx versus the chiari malformation with syrinx, and there's really no difference. So if your hypothesis was that the tonsils are responsible for syrinx formation, or the tonsil emotion was responsible, this doesn't support that because uh, patients without syringomyelia have just as much 
tonsil emotion of the, as those with. But incidentally, we found during the study that the amount of stretching of the cerebellum, so as we were t tracking this motion, it's, it's not the whole cerebellum that's moving up and down. It's actually stretching. And that the, gr the greatest stretch was observed in those patients who reported cough-induced headaches, which has always been a bit of a mystery to us how that happens. And it may be that the cough-induced headache is actually related in some way to the stretching of the cerebellum, perhaps by stretching the nerve fibres around the blood vessels. And that's something that we're continuing to work on. OK, so uh, in carry malformation, there is an increase in hindbrain motion that does change with surgery, but there's not really a significant difference in those patients with syringa myelia, which we think is evidence against the piston theory. Doesn't prove it, doesn't prove it but it's evidence against. With our ongoing work, we want to be able to try and pharmacologically manipulate syrinx cavities, particularly with acroporin uh, changes. And to do that, we don't want to sacrifice animals at every different time point. We want to use, follow the same animals. And so it's important for us to know that if we, look, if we use MR, for example, that it is an accurate reflection of syrinx size. So we did a study looking at the histological changes and comparing that to what we see on MR and, and showed that it's, it's actually a very accurate um, relationship between the MR appearances and the histological appearances, which I suppose is not surprising, but we had to do that before going on with those studies. It's, it's a very accurate correlation between syrinx size and shape, uh, morphology, and between histology and MR. <coughs> okay. You've seen that we've changed our traces from horse radius peroxidase to now we're using the fluorescent traces. The reason for that is that with horse radius peroxidase we can't actually assess that macroscopically, whereas with the fluorescent, tra fluorescent traces we can look at those in a macroscopic CNS as well as microscopically in the same animal. And we can get some uh, quantification of the studies. So we've chosen Alexa Fluor, which is about the same molecular size as horse radius peroxidase. It was really important. The molecular size of the trace is important in, in studying fluid flow. And in, an example is this constriction model where we've got a suture tied around the dura. We can look at the whole brain and spinal cord uh, once it's been taken out. And with the fluorescent images, we can see where the tracer is in the whole central nervous system macroscopically. So that's a, these are controls, and as expected, the tracer's injected here, there's a lot that gets into the ventricles, and then it just sort of gradually tapers down the spine, whereas in the, in the animals with constriction, there is an increase in fluid accumulation in the cord, perhaps surprisingly just below the level of constriction. And we can uh, analyse that numerically, I'll just go through quickly. Uh, we can sh we, this is the level of constriction. So controls in blue, constriction animals in orange. And we've shown that there is an increase in fluid accumulation in the cord in the constriction animals with a, some quantification uh, ability with those. Uh, so it, and that changes as the constriction matures. So over six weeks, there's an increase in, an even greater increase in fluid accumulation in the cord uh, around the level of constriction. Okay. Coming back to the aquaporin story, the location of aquaporins is important. So you may be aware of this uh, so-called glymphatic circulation where we know that fluid comes in through perivascular spaces and gets into the CNS tissue, but it seems that it does flow across the tissue. In the spinal cord, we think some of it gets into the central canal, but at least in the brain, a lot of it goes into the perivascular spaces around the veins and then back out into the subarachnoid space. And it's thought that this is functioning to wash out molecules from the extracellular space of the central nervous system. But that flow depends on aquaporins lining the perivascular spaces. And that's how the fluid gets, gets out of perivascular spaces. So we've uh, done some studies looking at... What we want to know is, are the aquaporins distributed differently <coughs> in different types of vessels because this whole relationship between arteries and veins we think is going to be very important in the spinal cord particularly when it comes to questions about possi possible obstructions to outflow the uh, effect of uh, constriction, arachnoiditis and central canal occlusion and so on. And what we've done is, I'll just go through these quickly, is just uh, develop methods to identify their central canal 
using smooth muscle actin as a marker of arterioles, we can identify aquaporin, so this is uh, aquaporin in green, nuclei in, in blue, and then we can identify where aquaporins are on all the different types of vessels. We can identify arterioles, uh, this is looking at smooth muscle actin in yellow, recta is all blood vessels, and so uh, we can see the green aquaporin around the blood vessel here, which is a, an arteriole because it stains with the smooth muscle actin as well as the endothelial marker. Without going, I'll just go through this quickly. So we can look at all the different layers. This is an arteriole, there's the endothelium, there's the smooth muscle, there's the aquaporins. And so we can measure the amount of aquaporin around individual vessels. And this is, these are in control animals, obviously. And same with capillaries and venules. And the idea being that we want to be able to, now that we know what it's like in the normal spinal cord, determine what the effects of syringomyelia are on the acroporin expression around the particular blood vessels and what happens with the perivascular spaces. So we showed in, in normal animals, at least in our, in our preliminary studies, that there, there is more acroporin in capillaries and venules than around arterioles. This is this uh, convection idea that fluid is going from, art, from around arteries to around veins. Uh, the prevascular space ultrastructure is obviously very important and we're doing work to look at that. So this is a three-dimensional image where the um, uh, green is aquaporin. Uh, sorry, actually in this one the green is a tracer in the prevascular space and the red is uh, an endothelial marker. And so we can look at the three-dimensional structure of this individual vessel and look at the perivascular space and how the tracer has got into it. And we can match that up with electron microscopy. So this is, we've just completed the study and about to submit it for publication where we looked at the ultrastructure of perivascular spaces in the cord central grey matter. And our next step will be to see what happens in syringomyelia in the different models. So our current work is looking at CSF outflow the effects of constriction and central canal occlusion, the ultrastructure uh, of perivascular spaces and how they change in syrinx, uh, in different types of syrinx, and also looking at the physiological effects of CSF flow into the cord with cardiac and respiratory pulsations. I wanted to just finish back on a clinical note to just um, touch on the things that we think, or I think, are still clinical problems. And I've put Chiari malformation here at the top of the list, not as a clinical problem, actually, because it's a clinical problem for patients with Chiari malformation in terms of their headache and other symptoms. But I don't actually think it's a problem for syringomyelia if they're identified and treated. And I'll show you that in a second. I think these are the important clinical problems. Idiopathic syringomyelia, cranial cervical junction arachnoiditis, and those patients where they have had recurrent serious <laughs> Uh, after Chiari malformation or other, other problems. So here's a patient with Chiari malformation. If you get a good technical result from surgery with a, a good decompression, CSF space around the tonsil, the syrinx will go away. So that's why I say it's not necessarily a problem in terms of understanding it or in terms of the patient's the syrinx collapsing. They may still be symptomatic because of the core damage and they may still be symptomatic from the Chiari malformation, but if we get a good technical result, the syrinx will go away. Now, that doesn't mean we understand how it happens, right? Uh, and that's still a really interesting question. But it's not a clinical problem if you can do that. It's, this is an idiopathic, or what may be seen to be idiopathic. And the way that we're working on so addressing this problem is improving our imaging techniques. And you saw the dynamic imaging that I showed earlier. In the past, this would have just been an idiopathic syrinx, and we would have had to operate to shunt. Well, what we now know, what we can see with our dynamic imaging, is that there's an arachnoid band here. Again, that may not show up terrifically with the light, but there is a, a band here that's clearly demonstrated on the dynamic imaging. And that is the thing that we think causes the syrinx. Now, how it does it, obviously, is still yet to be determined, but it is related to it. At operation, this is intropic ultrasound. We can see that a band here. This is the syrinx inside the cord. That's the band. And this is it at operation where that's the cord rostral to the band, that's the arachnoid band, and as I open it, 
CSF comes out from below it. So it's clearly a separate compartment of CSF. And the syrinx collapses with that. Uh, in this patient, uh, again, you might think that the, co the cause for that is not clear. There's no Chiari malformation. But with the dynamic imaging, we can see that there is actually arachnoiditis here. This patient had a traumatic birth, and this is arachnoiditis from a, a perinatal hemorrhage. That was the cause of the syrinx. And with surgery, with a shunt and decompressing and opening up that arachnoiditis, the syrinx goes away. So the imaging is helping to understand these things. It doesn't necessarily help us to... It doesn't mean we've understood the pathophysiology any better, but it helps us to, to manage the patients. With craniocervical junction arachnoiditis, this is a patient who's had trauma, uh, syrinx going right up to here. What we're seeing on ultrasound in many of these patients is there is actually a connection from the fourth ventricle into the, into the syrinx cavity. So I think for some of these patients, it is actually... The pathology is probably that there's obstruction of CSF outflow from the fourth ventricle, and it is being forced into the syrinx cavity, a la Gardner's original theory. But they're unusual, um, but they do happen. This is an example of how we manage those patients. So this is resecting the dura that's completely stuck on the, on the cerebellum and the spinal cord, uh, dividing all those arachnoid adhesions. And what we're seeing here is the opening into the fourth ventricle has become occluded with scar tissue. So the, the CSF was unable to get out of the fourth ventricle and was being forced down into the cord. And so one of the ways we manage that is to put a shunt from the fourth ventricle down into the spinal subarachnoid space to keep that avenue uh, of fluid flow open. And the no syrinx cavities will collapse when you do that. So I'm hoping that this is informative in terms of trying to understand the pathophysiology, right? <laughs> um, then there are patients where uh, the original posterior fossa decompression is not technically satisfactory and the syrinx either doesn't go away or comes back and that's problematic. So here's a patient where you might look at that and think that that's a good decompression because there's a big CSF space here but that's actually the dura stuck on the cerebellum. This is CSF outside the dura and that doesn't help. The syrinx, will, the syrinx comes back. That's not a technically satisfactory result. And we can... That is a dynamic scan. The cerebellum's not moving. It's completely stuck to the dura. And that was what it looked like, that surgery. So we've opened up. That, that's, the CSF just comes out. There was no dura on the outside of it. And that's the dura deep to the CSF cavity that's stuck on the cerebellum. With a uh, good technical result, that's the same patient. So we've reconstructed the posterior fossa with a better technical result. And the syrinx goes away. And a similar case a posterior fossa decompression, not a good technical result, um, but with an improvement in the CSF flow across here, the syrinx collapses. And then finally, there's the idiopathic ones. This is the one I showed earlier, where there is absolutely no evidence of what the underlying problem here is. One of the problems, even with the dynamic scan, is that we can't even see the subarachnoid space here. So there might be an abnormality there, although in this case there wasn't. Um, but it would be hard to see on dynamic scan. And just to show you what we do with putting a syrinx to subarachnoid shunt, this is opening the dura. So what we're seeing here is the arachnoid still intact. CSF starting to come out. That's the arachnoid. Uh, Bryn likes to see arachnoid. There you are. Uh, and the cord looks completely normal on the surface. Right? The syrinx is inside there. We've confirmed that with an ultrasound. Uh, I'm putting the arachnoid up onto the dura. The key now is to find the exact precise midline, which you can see those blood vessels going into the cord there. I was talking to Bryn before about looking around the cord into the, around the ventral aspect. So that's the midline where those blood vessels penetrate the cord, that one and that one. So if we open the cord directly in the midline, we separate the dorsal columns, we can do that without creating a neurological deficit. And I put this up because a lot of neurosurgeons are very much against uh, syrinx to subarachnoid shunts or syr any sort of syrinx shunts. Hal, are you a shunter? No. No. I'm hoping I'll change your mind. <laughs> so, um, so what I've done here is uh, just move that vein to the side so I can get into the cord. This is going exact directly in the midline. The syrinx, if it's two millimetres may sound like a pretty short distance, but going through the spinal cord, it's a long way. This is about one and a half millimetres. There's the syrinx cavity I just see there. So we're into the syrinx cavity now. And what I'll do next is put a little 
piece of, of tube <coughs> into that. Now this, this is 1.1 millimetres diameter, that plastic tube, to give you an idea of the scale. And this is not me with a tremor. I'm just sort of deliberately uh, wriggling it in. <laughs> just in case you, <laughs> you've got otherwise. <laughs> not a tremor. So that's, that's sliding into the syrinx cavity. It's only a short tube, it's only about this long, and goes into the subarachnoid space, and then we stitch it onto the surface of the cord. So it's, you saw it at the beginning, I put the arachnoid, I've clipped the arachnoid up onto the dura. I think that's really important because this tube has to get into the subarachnoid space. If you let the arachnoid just fl flop down onto the cord, it, it sort of separates from the dura and you can end up putting the tube into the sub, sub uh, dural space and that's not effective uh, and so this is that same patient with that small tube you can't even see it on the MRI and the syrinx has collapsed have I changed your mind oh. no <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's still things we don't know which is the same list that I had at the beginning basically uh, it's one of those things where we, the more I think we know about it the less I really understand it I'd like to think that we've made some uh, inroads into understanding the CSF physiology and how that might relate to syrinx formation, but I certainly couldn't stand here and pretend that we've solved the problem. This is obviously a big team effort. I've probably left some people out, um, but uh, just to acknowledge that this is um, uh, lots of people's work and is, and is an ongoing uh, thing. We've had lots of support from so the people and uh, financial bodies. Thanks again for inviting me to talk and I hope that was helpful. Uh, sort of def in defense of my no. Yes. Um, the, I agree with you that I, I've shunted a lot of syring syringes. Um, and I still do it when I absolutely have to, but it's a, it's a last resort for me. Sure. And um, the, the focal <coughs> spinal syrinx, um, John Heiss has written a few recent articles on, on that subject, is the most confusing of all of the things that you've talked mm -hmm. about. Why does the, it looks like the uh, uh, python has eaten a rat. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very focal, focal thing. And, John postulates. You're talking are, about that. Yes, exactly yes. that. Mm. And um, uh, John uh, postulates that there's a that the arachnoiditis is not seeable, but is still there, and that he does a myelogram that he actually does himself, where he rolls the the die up and then tries <coughs> to roll it back down, and what it's when your head's down it can get up, but when you when it can't, it comes down. And I was a skeptic, but I sent him a patient that I didn't want to put a shunt in, and, and that exactly thing happened. And he, he did sort of a circumferential look around the, the, the and found some arachnoidal adhesions mm. and did not open the spinal cord, and it's perfect. And he did a duroplasty? Uh, I don't mm. remember. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't see it. I, I no. only saw the post-operative MRI scans. He said, they look what I did. And um, I... I will try very hard to find some other reason, and I, um, if there's a, it's, it's, it's not infrequent, this looks perfectly pristine, but it's not un, 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 unusual that there's a disc or a focal stenosis at, the, uh, at that level, and I, I think giving it more room and making sure there are no bands around it, this is a beautiful talk. Uh, thank you for using my, my thing, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful and somewhat mysterious thing but if we can solve this problem, the problem with this, with the with the syrinx shunt, is that a few patients get extreme <coughs> dysesthetic pain as a result of the catheter in the and and I end up taking them out. Number one, number two is we also have tethering of the spinal cord at that position. So if it's a mobile portion of the spine, two years later, three years later, they start getting pain in relationship to it, and 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 some increase in their neurologic deficit without the thing coming over without the syrinx getting larger. So whatever strategy we do, I would like to try to find a way not to shut them. And, and, and I completely agree with you. But I, but I have to say I've, been, I've not been impressed with addressing things like disc protrusions or narrowing. I've not, been, I've not found the duroplasties very effective. And so for this type of 
syrinx. I, I, I don't think there's any other choice. And, and this patient is symptomatic. No, I understand. And, and, and those things that you talk about, the dysesthesia and the cord tethering, I agree are potential problems. And so that's why um, I think with the, the dysesthesia, it's really important to have it in the midline, isn't it? I agree with that. And then making sure that the arachnoid stays intact um, and that there's no blood that gets in during surgery, I think helps to avoid the tethering. So I've, we've not had those kind of problems. Um, I mean, I know that they can happen. Can I just back up Hal on the on the um, myelogram thing? Because I, I, I love backing up Hal at every opportunity that I can get. But I, I have to do it again now this time. So Williams was a, was in the pre-MRI days, and he worked with uh, myelogram. So he would do them himself, and he devised the posterior fossa decompression whilst Gardner was advocating plugging the obex. So Williams accused Gardner of stumbling on his surgery for syringomyelia by accident. So he suggested to Gardner that what, what he was actually doing, instead of plug, plugging the obex, which was a waste of time, he was actually decompressing the posterior fossa. So in Europe, the obex was not plugged, whereas in the United States, as Mark will tell you, the obex was plugged for quite some time and it's no longer plugged. So basically, Williams used, got myodil, and what I, you know, what I would postulate might be a good idea is if we can make a journey through the subarachnoid space, uh, you know, physicists can help us to do that without <laughs> doing any damage, that, that would be what we need to do. And, you know, the, the myodel is doing exactly what Hal says. I would, I would like to. The problem, I mean, the myodel would be no, 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 would be useful. No, 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 no. I'm because, not saying well, we use myodil. Yeah. Okay? That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the conclusions that were drawn from. Yes. I'm not suggesting myodil is a good idea. It's well, you can't get it. I hope. Yeah, meat like mice. So, but but so that the contrast agents now are water soluble, and so it's, it can be difficult to demonstrate partial obstructions in the subject space? You could use ultrasonic microbubbles. So there are various things you could use. I don't have the answer to that. I don't have the answer to that. But, you know, microbubbles, I can not know what comes next. As far as the types of the As far as the fact that syrinx is a film with aqueous syrup, you remain wet into high molecular weight presence. Why? If you use a low molecular, it's not, 40 kilodaltons is not high. Right? And what the balance we have is if you use a small molecular weight tracer, then it's good in the sense that it can follow where water goes, say, in between cells. But it, it, even the smallest tracer would be too big to go through, through aquaporin channels. But the problem is that the diffusion of small molecular weight tracers is so rapid, it's not really telling you bulk flow. So we, we go with the larger tracer that is, is large enough to be more indicative of bulk flow as opposed to diffusion. Um, whereas if you use a very large molecular weight tracer such as India ink, which has been used a lot, it's too big to get between cells and so it can't really tell you those pathways. There's no ideal tracer, but uh, you know if you have a very low molecular weight tracer and put it in, it just goes everywhere. Yeah. But I mean I live the shed sort of quite different uh, results from different molecular weight tracers. Yeah. Um, mm. does Taking a point about diffusion, we are essentially trying to follow the water. We're trying to, I think we're trying to follow the bulk flow water. I mean, this is, it's about pulsations, I think. So it's, it's where the fluid is moving like this, right? Not, not where it can permeate by diffusion. It's, it's not a situation where, where fluid is just sort of travelling in one direction and getting into the into the syrinx. I think what you're trying to say is yeah. you're trying to get a flow rate, right? By mm -hmm. using a higher molecular weight, he's determining how, how much faster how much flow is going. But just using it then really go everywhere. Am I right about that? Yep. I mean the, can I can I say so the, the CNS, there's the blood brain or the blood spinal cord barrier on one side. The other side is the tight junctions between the arachnoid cells that line the dura. Between those two layers, there is no obstruction to water. It's one water space. 
And the only reason that you have different compartments of fluid is the dynamic nature of, of the fluid. If you put a, a tracer anywhere in that system, it can diffuse through that whole system. I think that's, at this rate, it's, it will be difficult to distinguish diffusion from bulk, bulk flow, no matter what you do. Yeah. Maybe more relevant or easier to get would be driving gradients. For example, uh, gradients Sorry. of pressure. Yeah. Uh, osmotic gradients. If you have aquaporin and forward, and it's just uh, improvement of the diffusivity of, of water, basically permeability of water, but there is no uh, established gradient for that. So in this case, for example, would it be possible to measure proximal and distal the series, pressure dynamically, and see if you have a pressure gradient from above uh, to below the syrinx, and how this changes then afterwards after you've done uh, surgery and connected uh, the two spaces. That would be nice. I, I, I think that there's a bit of an ethical problem here in the sense that you know, doing those kind of manipulations in patients would be a little tricky ethically. You'd have to do a bigger operation to get exposure above and below. But more importantly as well, is that as soon as you lose a drop of CSF, the whole thing changes. If you put a needle in to measure the pressure, if you lose any CSF, it's unreliable. So we, we have done some experiments, I didn't show it, where we um, created arachnoiditis in sheep and put a monitor above and below and then let them wake up and walk around for six weeks and get telemetry recordings from them. Um, it technically is very challenging and there's definitely a, a chance a, we, there seems to be a pulse difference and a, and a pressure difference in, in the pulse pressure above and below, but I don't think, we can't be completely sure about that, can we? Yeah, it wasn't very clean data yeah. for animals, and, and we didn't have anything inside the court. These were in the subarachnoid space. I think technically, you know, I'll let the neurosurgeons talk about that, but actually measuring the internal pressure and the syrinx in a, in a live animal while they're moving around, I think it's it's, it's quite luck. straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to do. And, and of course, with an anaesthetised patient prone, mechanical ventilation, you know, the pressures are, are, are hard to interpret. All right, that was wonderful talk and wonderful discussion. I'm going to have to cut it off there in the interest of time. But fortunately, with this type of meeting, we're going to have access to Marcus for the next. 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Please cover him with questions. Let's thank our speaker one more time.